From PRI, Public Radio International, it's to the best of our knowledge. I'm Jim Fleming. Srinivasa Ramanujan is one of the great stories in the history of mathematics. The young clerk from India with no formal math training, who went to Cambridge University and was later declared a genius. But what's often forgotten is where Ramanujan found his inspiration. Ramanujan was a devout Hindu Brahmin who claimed that the mathematical discoveries that he made came to him in dreams through the agency of a goddess named Namagiri. He said that the goddess wrote the equations on his tongue. Today we'll talk about God, religion, and some of history's great scientists and mathematicians. We'll also meet the renowned mystic Thomas Keating, who tells his own story about how years ago he ended up in a Trappist monastery. I made several surreptitious visits to the monastery. It was like a tryst, really. The spiritual consolation is so strong that you can take all the other pleasures of the world and put them in the wastebasket without even noticing it. But first, a look back at Albert Einstein. He died more than a half century ago. But religious believers are still fighting with atheists over one basic question. Did the great physicist believe in God? And what difference does it make anyway? Well, the science and religion debate raging today often turns on the very questions that Einstein raised. Can you reconcile belief in a personal God with the laws of physics? Or is God just another word for order and harmony in the universe? So what did Einstein think about religion? Steve Paulson asked a number of leading scientists, atheists, and religious thinkers, including Richard Dawkins, Elaine Pagels, Steven Weinberg, and John Haught, and he has this report. Einstein never had much patience for organized religion, except for a brief childhood flirtation with Jewish rituals. But once he made his reputation as a great scientist, he seemed strangely compelled to talk about religion. Einstein called himself a deeply religious non-believer, and he famously said, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. But what did he actually believe? Einstein biographer Walter Isaacson says people have been fighting over that question for decades. People who are very strongly atheists try to claim him, and people who are very religious try to claim him, and he resisted both, although he said two or three times, I resist more what he called the fanatical atheists for trying to embrace him because he said that they were so fervent. One of those fervent atheists is Richard Dawkins, the famed biologist and author of The God Delusion. Einstein clearly was an atheist in the sense that he didn't believe in any sort of personal God. He used the word God as a sort of metaphoric name for that which we don't yet understand, for the deep mysteries at the foundation of the universe. Those comments are echoed by another prominent atheist, the Nobel Prize-winning physicist Steven Weinberg. Einstein, in a letter to a friend of his, famously explained that he did not believe in a God who cared about human beings, who was concerned with human affairs, that for him God was a synonym for harmony and order in the universe. In other words, when Einstein says God, he really is talking about the laws of nature or whatever fundamental principle governs the universe without regard to anything remotely resembling a, a personal God. But let's look at why Einstein found that idea of God objectionable. John Haught is a Catholic theologian at Georgetown University and the author of many books on science and religion. He says you have to understand Einstein's view of physics to see why he couldn't stomach the idea of a personal God. Einstein was a man who thought that the laws of physics have to be completely inviolable, that nature is a closed continuum of deterministic causes and effects. And if anything interrupted that, it would violate the fundamental scientific worldview that he had. And so the idea of a personal God in answering our prayers would have to violate the laws of physics, the laws of nature. And this is why Einstein said that the problem of science and religion is caused by the belief that many people have in a personal God. And here is where John Haught disagrees with Einstein. In fact, I don't think God does violate the laws of physics and chemistry. So, can we reconcile a personal God with the hard and fast laws of nature? Well, this brings us to Einstein's most famous quote about religion, God does not play dice with the universe. Einstein believed we live in a deterministic universe in which every event is caused by other events. It's why he could never fully accept the new science of quantum mechanics, 
or at least its so-called Copenhagen interpretation, as laid out by Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. In their view, reality at the quantum level is inherently probabilistic. A single subatomic particle can occupy different areas of space at the same time. What's more, the act of observing a quantum phenomenon plays a critical role in actually creating that phenomenon. This suggests that consciousness itself helps shape physical reality. So from a religious perspective, you could argue that some higher consciousness, call this God if you want, could interact with the material world, such as the human brain. Nancy Murphy, a Christian philosopher at Fuller Theological Seminary, claims that Einstein's refusal to accept the possibility of an indeterminate universe ended up limiting his science. He kept holding out for the possibility of hidden variables. If you go the next level down below, quantum physics, whatever that is, you would then find a deterministic explanation for what appears at the quantum level to be indeterministic. And most scientists have concluded that he was just wrong. There is no lower level that determines it all. The fact of opening up all possibilities is liberating and terrifying. Daniel Matt is one of the foremost scholars of Jewish mysticism author of the book God and the Big Bang, he says quantum physics has profound implications for spirituality and our ideas about free will. We should be open to the possibilities of chance. You know, sometimes people want to do away with chance, and Einstein himself, of course, famously commented that God does not play dice with the universe. In many ways, physics bypassed Einstein for the last several decades of his life. Part of that was because he was uncomfortable with some of the implications of quantum mechanics, and specifically of open-ended probabilities in the universe. These questions about chance and quantum mechanics are still hotly debated by physicists today. And the philosophical questions they raise, do we live in a deterministic universe, do we have free will, may never be resolved. But there's another, more religious question that Einstein posed, and it has to do with the language we use to talk about God. The physicist Steven Weinberg says Einstein's God talk is just plain confusing. Clearly, what he meant by God is so vague and so far from conventional religion that it seems to me a a misuse of the word. I think the concept of God has historically had a fairly definite meaning. Of course, people have argued endlessly about the attributes of God, but there were common features that God was conscious, that God was powerful, that God was benevolent to some extent. If you're not going to use the word God to mean something like that, something like its historical meaning, then I don't think you should use the word. Elaine Pagels, the renowned historian of early Christianity, agrees that we shouldn't take Einstein's God talk literally. But she points out that science itself is full of metaphors. Just consider such evocative phrases as the Big Bang and black holes. You know, part of the problem there is that Einstein used the language about God as a conscious metaphor. When he said God doesn't play dice with the universe, that is, he meant the universe is not put together in an accidental way. Einstein was speaking about God in the way that physicists would, aware that language like that is always going to be metaphorical, speaking about something beyond our understanding. It's clear that Einstein did not believe in a God who answers prayers or intervenes in human affairs, but his comments about a cosmic creator suggest that he may have been another kind of religious believer, a deist. Richard Dawkins doesn't buy that either. For me, the divide comes with whether you believe there is some kind of a supernatural personal being. And I think that deists believe that, as well as theists. And by that criterion, I don't think Einstein was a deist, and he certainly wasn't a theist. I think it's misleading to use a word like God in the way that Einstein did. I'm sorry that Einstein did. I think that he was, in a way, asking for trouble, asking to be misunderstood. Well, it's interesting that you say in in your definition of religion or of a religious believer that it involves a personal being, because I think a lot of people would actually disagree with that, who would consider themselves strongly religious, but they would consider the whole idea of a personal God as being an outdated notion of what religion is. Well, then I would want to know what they did mean by it, because what you're now saying is that conceivably Einstein could be called a religious person, and indeed so could I. But I would take my stand on whether the the God, or whatever it is, the being, whatever we're talking about, is complicated and improbable. 
and something that has those attributes of a person, intelligence, creativity, something of that sort. If you believe that the universe was created by a designing intelligence, whether you call that personal or not, that seems to me to be a good definition of God, and that's what I don't believe in, and that's what Einstein did not believe in. But Einstein's most recent biographer, Walter Isaacson, says it's a mistake to dismiss Einstein's comments as strictly metaphorical. He claims that Einstein knew exactly what he was doing when he used words like God and religion. He believed in what he called a cosmic religion. And he said, there's a spirit manifest in the laws of the universe in the face of which we must be humbled and awed. And it's that sense of a cosmic order that is my sense of reverence and my sense of religion. At one point, some cardinal in Boston said, well, it still smacks of atheism because it's not a personal God. So Rabbi Goldstein, the head of the Reformed Jewish movement in New York, sends him a telegram and says, do you or do you not believe in God, Einstein? Answer, 50 words or less. <laughs> and Einstein says, I believe in Spinoza's God, a God whose spirit is manifest in the harmonies of the universe. And I think it may be very hard for certain rabbis or cardinals and certain very religious people and certain very dedicated atheists to get at what he was driving at. But I know Benjamin Franklin would have understood it. I mean, he was a deist who believed in a creator and that this was something too vast for our imagination. It's interesting because I think the whole idea of deism has, has really gone out of fashion recently. I mean, it's sort of right. considered not real religion. Okay, maybe God sort it's of created the laws of, of physics, moderate. but then what does that yeah. mean? It's just sort of God is nature. Does that actually mean anything? And it's easy to just sort of write that off as, oh, that's that's not really God. I mean, that's kind of atheism in disguise. Yes, deism may have gone out of fashion because we live in a polarized time where people feel you have to be in either in favor of a personal God or not believe in God at all. But there have been many deists throughout history, whether it's uh, Benjamin Franklin or Spinoza or Einstein or pantheists who embrace things like that. I think the most important thing for Einstein is that there was a sense of humility. We do not know the answer here, but he did say he did have a belief in what he called his God, and a God as a creator. Well, I think a lot of people just see this as, oh, he was exercising his poetic license. You know, he wanted to use God as kind of a, a synonym for mystery or something like that, but that's not really the case. I mean, he, he took that word more seriously. When he was asked whether he was using the word just symbolically or whatever, he said no, he wasn't. That he considered himself having a cosmic religion, he thought there was a spirit manifest in the laws of the universe, and to him that was his notion of God. Now, I know I've read Richard Dawkins who says it's much more figurative. People kept saying, well, you're just speaking figuratively, and he says no. These debates about how we talk about God and whether science and religion can ever be truly reconciled are still with us today. But I suppose we should ask another question. Does it really matter what Einstein said 70 or 80 years ago? Steven Weinberg doesn't think so. Einstein is a great physicist, the greatest physicist certainly of the 20th century and one of the greatest of all time. But we don't take Einstein as an authority, even in matters of physics. Anyone today getting into an argument about general relativity wouldn't quote Einstein as an authority to settle the issue because we understand these things better than Einstein did. In fact, this is one of the differences between science and religion. We don't have that kind of sacred authority whose word is taken as the ultimate answer to questions, not even Einstein. So maybe we're left with a basic philosophical disagreement. Put aside the question of God for a moment and ask yourself this. Do you take solace or comfort from the apparent order and harmony of the universe? Weinberg himself once famously wrote, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. He believes that meaning is something we humans have to create for ourselves. It's pointless to look for it out in the cosmos. But some scientists consider that view too bleak and verging on nihilistic. Take the cosmologist Joel Premack, one of the discoverers of dark matter and co-author of the book The View from the Center of the Universe. He does not think humans are just insignificant specks in a shapeless, endless cosmos. And he quotes Einstein, who said there was only one question that really mattered. Did God have a choice? Could the universe have been put together in any other way? 
he also said the most mysterious thing about the universe is that we can understand it, that there's some kind of connection between the way the human mind works and the deep underlying concepts that describe how the universe works. And Einstein, like I think most successful physical scientists, had a profound belief that if we really try hard, we can understand this amazing universe. That's an article of faith. And in that sense, Premack says we're all believers. But should we really call that impulse religious? Well, that's a question we're likely to keep arguing about, and ultimately our answer reveals a great deal about how we see our own place in the world. Steve Paulson put together our report on Einstein and God. So what do you think? Was Einstein a religious person? Does it even matter what Einstein thought about God? You can send your comments by email through our website at ttbook.org. We'd love to hear from you. Coming up, how Carl Jung changed the life of another Nobel Prize winning physicist. I'm Jim Fleming. It's to the best of our knowledge from PRI, Public Radio International. Einstein wasn't the only great physicist to grapple with the deep meaning of religion. The Austrian Wolfgang Pauli was a Nobel Prize winning physicist who helped lay the foundation for quantum mechanics. While he was in his early 30s, Pauli had an emotional breakdown after a divorce, and he went to the famed psychiatrist Carl Jung for psychotherapy. Jung was amazed to hear Pauli describe his dreams, which seemed to come right out of Jung's ideas about archetypes. Pauli's dreams tapped into all kinds of mythic imagery, especially the mandala. I come to a strange, solemn house, the house of the gathering. Many candles are burning in the background, arranged in a peculiar pattern, with four points running upward. Outside, at the door of the house, an old man is posted. People are going in. They say nothing and stand motionless in order to collect themselves inwardly. The man at the door says of the visitors to the house, when they come out again, they are cleansed. I go into the house myself, find I can concentrate perfectly. And then a voice says, what you are doing is dangerous. Religion is not a tax to be paid so that you can rid yourself of the woman's image, for this image cannot be got rid of. Woe unto them who use religion as a substitute for the other side of the soul's life. They are in error and will be accursed. Religion is no substitute. It is to be added to the other activities of the soul as the ultimate completion. Out of the fullness of life shall you bring forth your religion. Only then shall you be blessed. While the last sentence is being spoken, in the ringing tones I hear distant music, simple chords on an organ. And something about it reminds me of Wagner's fire music. And as I leave the house, I see a burning mountain, and I feel the fire that cannot be put out is a holy fire. Wolfgang Pauli's dream as read by Carl Schmidt. Jungian analyst David Lindorf has written a book called Pauli and Jung, The Meeting of Two Great Minds. He told Anne Strangehamps that Jung's ideas had a profound impact on Pauli. In fact, Pauli went on to study the history of mysticism and even alchemy. All the while, carrying on his groundbreaking work in theoretical physics. The uh, quantum level of thinking in physics contained a mystery, but he realized that there was a mystery in the unconscious also, and this is what 
turned his life into being a, a study that engaged him and Jung for 20 years. And then the other thing that's so fascinating about that is, you know, most scientists, if they have a spiritual life, they tend to separate it from their scientific work. These are two different realms. But Pauli really believed that these two worlds, science and spirituality or mysticism, could be brought together? He felt they must be. For the benefit of civilization, he felt that this was a necessary step. It led him back to some studies of the way in which mankind saw science early in the 17th century, where mystery, mysticism, was included in the development of science. Of course, then, with Jung's help, he became interested in alchemy. But, you know, to say that a theoretical physicist developed a fascination with alchemy is about like saying, you know, he began studying magic. That's a really fascinating thing for a highly trained Western scientist to get absorbed in. What was it that he found so significant about alchemy? Well, first of all, I think he wouldn't have turned in that direction had he not experienced the uh, theory of the quantum, because everything in quantum theory is a mystery. Feynman said, if you think you understand it, you don't. Now, this is what the physicists had to live with, and they still do today. But because of the fact that Pauli was having these dreams, which are also a mystery, he was ready, I think, to open up to that dimension. But it came because he'd been forced into it through his experience of physics. Hmm. He had this sort of interesting critique of the development of Western science. Do you remember how it went at all? He believed that at one point, science was a more mystical sort of pursuit. Well, that's true. Now, the interesting thing is that Newton is known for his quantitative definitions that persist today. But secretly, back some 30 years ago, they found out that Newton was also studying alchemy. So alchemy was not looked down upon. It was looked as a source of knowledge, which Jung interpreted as coming from their own psyche. I thought the alchemist's great mission was to find the philosopher's stone and figure out a way to turn base metal into gold. There are two things that happened to alchemy. One is that it became philosophical. And a few of the alchemists in the 16th century and before looked at the philosophy behind alchemy, where another group was more interested in what turned into being chemistry. So at the philosophical level, what sort of alchemical insights appealed to Pauli and to Jung? First, look at Jung. He found the dreams of his patients and of his self oftentimes had imagery which made no sense whatsoever until he found books on alchemy, it contained sort of the rudiments of those symbols. And that helped Jung to have confidence in the idea that there is a collective unconscious. Now, Pauli also tuned into this because of his own dreams. And uh, Jung said that Pauli knew more about alchemy than any other physicist. A square space with complicated ceremonies going on in it. The purpose of which is to transform animals into men. Two snakes moving in opposite directions have to be got rid of at once. Animals are there, foxes and dogs. The people walk around the square and must let themselves be bitten in the calf by these animals at each of the four corners. If they run away, all is lost. Now the higher animals come on the scene, bulls and ibexes. Four snakes glide into the four corners, then the congregation files out. Two sacrificial priests carry in a huge reptile, and with this they touch the forehead of a shapeless animal lump, or life mass, and out of it there instantly rises a human head transfigured. A voice proclaims, 
These are attempts at being. So he found in alchemy a model that could give him understanding of his dreams. But I want to say one thing that came later. When his dreams after the war turned to another way of expressing themselves, he realized that there was a way in which the physicists had an opportunity to see a mystery in matter that really was there, that the alchemists only imagined. So he believed that quantum mechanics, quantum physics, was in some ways a modern form of alchemy? Yes. And the big difference was that instead of being a psychic element of their imagination, it was real. Hmm. And this led to one of the great problems that he and Jung encountered, because he insisted that there really was a mystery in matter. And Jung had a hard time with that because he saw everything from a psychological point of view and said that the mystery is in the psyche. So Pauli really believed that the unconscious could influence matter? Yes. What Pauli did was, early on, he discovered that there are similarities between the psychic realm, and the quantum level. It's at the quantum level where the mysteries occur. In other words, there's a religious dimension to our psyche that can be experienced. That includes the quantum level. I can imagine that the closer Pauli and Jung became and the more absorbed Pauli got in in Jung's theories of synchronicity, there's another uncanny aspect to this, which is one of the, the famous things people say about Pauli. They refer to the Pauli effect. Can you explain what that was? <laughs> oh, I knew you'd have to mention that sooner or later. <laughs> people saw that his presence affected things. Like what? Well, there was a, a man by the name of Stern who worked with him in Hamburg, and he was an experimental physicist uh, who... Um, didn't want Pally to be even in the neighborhood if he ran an experiment. He said things went wrong. <laughs> what, experiments blew up? <laughs> Equipment broke just because Pally yeah, was around? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a, an experience w- with uh, Marcus Fierce, which I, uh, really was very valuable. He was a good friend of Pally's, and I had a lot of contact with him in writing this book. Fierce said, no, he said, there was no doubt. He said, if you knew Pauli, you knew the Pauli effect. Now, there's a little joke about this that you have to think to get it. He was visiting a couple of physicists' laboratories. They thought, let's play a joke on him. So they put a canister of water above the door so that in walking in, the door would dump the water on him. They thought this would be like, oh, the Pauli effect as a joke. They tested it again and again. It worked. When Pelly walked in, it didn't work. <laughs> so the Pelly effect worked on other people, not on Pelly himself. <laughs> and I, I attended a meeting one time in Pelly's uh, centennial, and some of the old timers were there to speak about Pelly and their experience with him. And one said, "The one thing to remember about the Pelly effect is that it never affected Pelly." David Lindorf talking with Anne Strangechamps. Lindorf is the author of the book Pauli and Jung, The Meeting of Two Great Minds. One of the most remarkable stories in the history of mathematics was the encounter between G. H. Hardy and Srinivasa Ramanujan. In 1913, when Hardy was a renowned mathematician at Trinity College in Cambridge, England, he received a strange letter from a young man in India. Dear Sir, I beg to introduce myself to you as a clerk in the accounts department of the Port Trust Office at Madras. The clerk said he had no university education and no formal training in mathematics, but he'd written out a series of numbers, letters, and symbols, nine pages of dense mathematics, and asked Hardy to look over the material. 
Being inexperienced, I would very highly value any advice you give me, requesting to be excused for the trouble I give you, S. Ramanujan. Hardy was so intrigued that he invited Ramanujan to come to Cambridge University. And the rest, as they say, is history. Today, Ramanujan is considered one of the century's true geniuses. The uneasy friendship between Hardy and Ramanujan is the subject of David Levitt's novel, The Indian Clerk. I asked Levitt why Hardy even bothered to read that first letter from the young clerk, which had all the earmarks of a crank letter. The answer to that puzzle lies in Hardy himself. He was the child of school teachers who grew up kind of in the vicinity of the British upper class, but not really a part of it. However, the fact that his parents were school teachers meant that he had access to the best kind of education available in the UK. So by the time Ramanujan came around, when Hardy was 37 years old, he was very, very well established. He was very much an insider. He was very much part of the establishment. But in many ways, he never felt himself to be an insider. There were certain aspects of his nature and character that led him to always feel a little bit outside of things. One was the fact that he was, at that point, in a very quiet way, homosexual. And he was an atheist. And a very, if it's not too much of a of an oxymoron, a very devout atheist. He was the Christopher Hitchens of his age. <laughs> and as an atheist, he necessarily put himself in a position of opposition to how the university operated. So in some ways, he was prepared to recognize someone like Ramanujan. He would see in Ramanujan some of himself. Absolutely. I think he saw a lot of himself. And I think he had a great impulse to rescue Ramanujan. The idea that there was this genius as Hardy saw it, languishing in a backwater without the benefits that Cambridge could offer him, without the nourishment that would allow him to thrive, disturbed Hardy tremendously, and he took it upon himself to save Ramanujan. It's important to understand what was going through Hardy's mind and also what he saw in Ramanujan. I don't think most of us are going to be able to grasp the kind of higher mathematics that they're talking about, but Hardy thought it was possible to explain those. The thing he cared most about was the, the Riemann hypothesis. Can you explain what that is? The Riemann hypothesis is still considered by most mathematicians, I would say, the most important unsolved problem in mathematics. It concerns the distribution of the prime numbers. It had long been proven that there were an infinity of prime numbers, but what Hardy and a lot of other mathematicians wanted to figure out was whether there was a method or a means by which the prime numbers could, as it were, be predicted. Just as a reminder, a prime number is a number that can be divided only by itself and one. Exactly. And as you look at the prime numbers as they move toward infinity, there are fewer and fewer. They're more widely spaced apart. But there doesn't, at least on the surface, appear to be any order to their distribution. The Riemann hypothesis, through a number of very complex mathematical steps, sought to recognize an order. And so a lot of mathematicians saw proving the Riemann hypothesis as kind of the holy grail of mathematics. Whoever yeah. proved the Riemann hypothesis would be, as Hardy would put it, immortal. I think it's kind of fascinating that you put it that way, and I think it's, it's entirely accurate, the holy grail of mathematics, because part of what's going on in the story that you're telling and in the real story of Ramanujan is this taint of magic that goes into an otherwise purely scientific discussion. Absolutely. Ramanujan, in contrast to Hardy, who was an atheist, was a devout Hindu Brahmin who claimed that the mathematical discoveries that he made came to him in dreams through the agency of a goddess named Namagiri, the goddess his family worshipped. At one point, he described it very poetically. He said that the goddess wrote the equations on his tongue. And this was a very difficult idea for Hardy to accept because it went so against his atheism. On the other hand, Hardy, I think, recognized the mystical aspect of mathematics, even if he resisted describing that mysticism as something religious or something having to do with a god. In fact, as you put it, as you tell the story anyway, Hardy had a particularly poor vicar to introduce him to the whole notion of religion and from then on would have nothing to do with it. It didn't prepare him at all for Ramanujan's spiritual connection. 
And I think Hardy put a lot of energy into trying to convince himself and others that Ramanujan's claims to spirituality were entirely fabricated and that, that he simply said that he made his discoveries through the agency of the goddess in order to placate his family and particularly his mother, whereas in reality, he was very, very rational. It's important to put this at a time and a place, too. I mean, the, they were at Cambridge, and this is at a time immediately preceding the First World War. Yes. Hardy received the letter in 1913, and Ramanujan arrived in 1914. He arrived about two months before the war began. So it was a moment, a very fraught, but also a very culturally rich moment in the history of England at the very end of the Edwardian period, when a lot of English people were really trying to throw off the shackles of Victorianism and, in some sense, rebel against the sort of rigidities that had defined English life up until that time. And, and he is at Cambridge. Uh, Hardy is at Cambridge. And, Hardy is at Trinity College, Cambridge, as and a fellow. And Ramanujan comes, and some of his colleagues there are Bertrand Russell. Wittgenstein, uh, John yes. Maynard Keynes, these are some of the great names in English intellectual circles. Exactly. So it was a sort of extraordinary moment to be at Cambridge. All the men you've just named were members of a secret society called the Apostles. What would you say was the general feeling of this group of men, the, the members of the Apostles, toward religion? What would Ramanujan have found in trying to discuss the world with these men? Well, I think that had Ramanujan had the opportunity, which he didn't very often, he would have found that they were very open to his ideas and very interested in them because most of the apostles, and in particular G.E. Moore, who was really the leader of the group, were very, very preoccupied with the philosophy of religion and in a sense with trying to change or in some ways make Christianity evolve. That's an interesting question, and that leads into what was probably the most difficult decision I had to make in the book, which was really whether or not to try to tell any of the story from Ramanujan's point of view. To do so would have involved trying to understand the world as he saw it, and that was something that I didn't feel as a Westerner and as an American I was really able to do. I felt that I could occupy and become Hardy, but I never felt that I could really become Ramanujan. So I, I elected to tell the story mostly from Hardy's point of view, but to consider Ramanujan as a stranger who enters into this very established world. And when it came time to approach Ramanujan's cultural background, you didn't feel, well, maybe honestly, you, you can't go into culture as deeply as you can go into science. Well, the problem for me in entering into Ramanujan's head was this fundamental question of what he actually believed versus what he claimed to believe. But that in and of itself is a very Western question because in a sense the idea of belief as we use the word in Western culture is much less important in Hindu culture as I've come to understand it. And so really it required entering into a way of thinking that was so different from the way of thinking that's been inculcated in me as someone who's a product of a Western education. And I just, in all honesty, didn't feel that I had the authority. Mm -hmm. But it is a kind of fascinating thing, isn't it? Because one of the big questions of modern mm -hmm. society is this, this debate about science and religion, how they fit together, yes. in what ways one opposes the other, in what ways they can move together. And the Ramanujan you've created in The Indian Clerk doesn't seem to have that divide. Religion no, and math fit integrally together. They fit beautifully. And there are a lot of different ways to explain that. Did Ramanujan actually have dreams in which formulae and equations magically appeared? Very probably he did. Were those dreams provoked by a goddess? Who knows? That's a very mysterious question. How important was he, do you think? He didn't live very long. And Ramanujan? Yeah. I think he was hugely important on a number of levels. No, he did not live very long. He only lived into his early 30s. The work that he did as a mathematician continues to bear fruit. The notebooks that he left have become in and of themselves an area of study. 
So on a mathematical level, he's incredibly important. I think on a cultural level, he's also incredibly important. He was the first non-white fellow of Trinity College. He was the second non-white fellow of the London Mathematical Society and the Royal Society, which was a big deal in those years. He broke a lot of barriers. But also, I think for Indians and Westerners alike, the story of his life, the story of someone, in a sense, plucked out of one culture and dropped down in the middle of another one is incredibly telling and incredibly resonant. And that's why the story continues to fascinate people so much. That's David Levitt. His novel is called The Indian Clerk. Coming up, a man who's devoted his life to spiritual contemplation, the Christian mystic, Thomas Keating. I'm Jim Fleming. It's to the best of our knowledge from PRI, Public Radio International. Father Thomas Keating is considered by some people to be one of the world's greatest living mystics. Now in his mid-80s, he's followed in the tradition of the ancient desert fathers, the original Christian mystics. For decades, Father Keating lived an austere monastic life. Later, he wanted to make the spiritual insights he'd learned more accessible to lay people, so he founded the Centering Prayer Movement. In recent years, He's also been engaged in a series of interreligious dialogues with leaders of other faiths. Father Keating recently stopped by our studio to talk with Steve Paulson about God and the contemplative life. He says the ultimate goal of Christian meditation is to become transformed. To put it bluntly, to become God, not in the full theological sense, because theology deals with reason rather than experience. So the shadow side, as Jung calls it, of our personality emerges with a great deal of force after a while in that process, and you make yourself vulnerable through silent meditation. Well, I would think that once you start doing this seriously, especially mm-hmm. for a beginner, I would think that just spending all of that time in silence well, with your t- own t- thoughts... Uh, totally th- changed my life. I left whatever I was doing and entered a monastery, which was about as radical a thing. as the, There were only three in this country at the time. And I deliberately chose it because it was an idea that if you really want to be a contemplative best to choose the hardest life you can find. And you is. became a Trappist monk, which is... Yeah, well, is, that was it's, considered it's, hard enough. Or as well, hard it's considered as one find. of the most austere orders there yes. is. Yes, it's since been somewhat humanized and moderated <laughs> since the Second Vatican Council, but it's it was radical. We got up 2 a.m. and 1 a.m. on feast days and about six or seven hours of chanting of the offices, consisting of psalms and prayers, and then there was a lot of work. And in those days, the diet was thin, no meat, fish, or eggs. Did that help you? I mean, just that austerity? Well, the chief thing that helped me, because I had already started to, I was two and a half or three years waiting to get in, because I was too young to go it right away. And so during that time, I I tried to bone up on being a monk as best I could in the world, to the great distress of my poor family, who didn't know what the heck I was up to. (laughs) It was really, had a certain element of of romance. I mean, what was I? I was 18, 19. And so I made several surreptitious visits to the monastery. It was like a tryst, really. The spiritual consolation is so strong that you can take all the other pleasures of the world and put them in the wastebasket without even noticing it. Now, you are well known for the centering prayer. Uh, What led you to pursue this particular practice and to teach it to other people? 
Well, it was a realization, you know, from my studies and practice and also my experience in the monastery. What really was significant about that is that you you can't help but see how much in oneself has to change in the way of attitudes, dispositions. And there is a battle, a struggle between the dark side of one's personality. Paul calls it the old man. Well, with a little psychological tweak that might be more suitable to our time, I call it the false self. Merton used that term, old self. So it's the self that you don't even think of, at least I didn't, until you take the spiritual journey or the transformative process seriously. And in my day, and it was a mistake. The hardest life was supposed to help you to reach this. Well, I no longer believe that, but it took me 20 or 30 years to work through that mindset. And this is because the real focus or meaning or depth of the contemplative tradition as a heritage in the Christian scheme of things was virtually lost for all practical purposes on the level of parish life where most people are, hmm. or even in Catholic schools or seminaries. And so there is this depth that contemplative prayer introduces one to. One moves beyond the false self to the true self, which is might also be called the spiritual level of our being. How how similar is this process you're describing to some of the meditative techniques that you find in some of the Eastern traditions, whether it's Buddhism or... Well, a human being is is pretty much the same in everybody. So similar methods, and the chief one is is to develop some capacity for concentration and clarity of mind because everybody is battered around in daily life. Well, part of the reason why I asked the question about the similarities between the, the contemplative Christian tradition that you're describing and some of the Eastern traditions is that The metaphysical systems are really very different. I mean, with Buddhism, the obvious difference is this is not a theistic system. The life that you have chosen is very theistic. I mean, you weren't invoking God. You were invoking Jesus in particular. And I'm wondering how similar the experience is once you get past the words that you use or the Buddhists use. I mean, do you think the experience itself, the spiritual experience, is pretty similar? I do. I think there are remarkable similarities. I find that the contemplative dimension is not restricted to any one religion. We're talking about a God whom we all agree is absolute or infinite in every direction, who is sheer uh, isness and beyond that, who is just plain being and existence and therefore is present in everything that exists. So so it's no one religion could possibly fully communicate this mystery. God is a word that's famously hard to, to talk about, to describe. Choose anyone you like. Well, uh, Butch, I just, fine with me. I'd love to have you, as as best as you can, talk about what your image of God is, or who is God, or what is God. I mean, how how would you describe this presence, this being, whatever God is? Well, to do this well, you, you have to go to heaven, or at least die. <laughs> but this absolute, as it's called in Buddhism, is a good word, and, and in our interreligious dialogues that we had at the monastery in Snowmass, Colorado, we we reached an agreement that we would call this reality that's called God in the Judeo-Christian tradition the ultimate reality. There was some discussion about calling it the ultimate mystery. Hence, anything you can say about God is a lie, strictly speaking. But since you need to say something or have some pointers towards the mystery, like Buddhism, you have the guy who pointed at his finger pointed at the moon. But he didn't get enlightened until somebody cut his finger off, <laughs> meaning there isn't anything to point to because all that we want to say about God is already here within us at a level that is beyond any kind of articulation or experience. That you, we you're can you're have. saying that words will always be inadequate to words, express. And I'm God. even saying that experience also is inadequate because it can only be translated by our human faculties, and God is infinitely beyond that. So until we lay aside the uh, body 
and the brain with all its uh, mechanics, we can't possibly make a completely full act of choice. You, you, and that's why death is, is kind of important in the Christian perspective. Hmm. So death is something you will welcome yourself. Well, well, sure, because this is a way of lifting a corner of the veil that hides the mystery of God and reveals that this absolute reality is utterly humble. One final question. There are more and more people now, secular people, who would say they don't believe in God, but who talk about experiencing the awe and wonder in nature in particular, and who talk about profound experiences there. And I'm wondering if if you think what these people are talking about has much connection to the profound experiences that, that people of faith Well, have. sure. There's only one God, one happiness, one ultimate experience. And God has many pathways. Religion is only one by which he draws people to himself such as generous service of others, conjugal love, nature, art, creativity, science, all of these things can be paths. But religion is, as a path is kind of concentrated, and so I think it'll continue to be a major path for a while. But nature is an equal path, if not close behind. And even the fathers of the church recognized this when they said there are two revelations. One is the Bible, the other is nature. Well, now we're in a new phase in which nature is not just looking at a beautiful sunset, but figuring out what the whole universe is is about, how it's constituted, what the subatomic world is uh, involves, and life and uh, study of the brain, all of this stuff is really revelations about God, how this thing works. These are God's thoughts. This is the way the Creator has figured this thing out. And well, what's the matter with you folks that you can't see this? Father Thomas Keating talking with Steve Paulson. Father Keating was the abbot of St. Joseph's Abbey in Massachusetts, and later one of the founders of the Centering Prayer Movement. It's to the best of our knowledge. I'm Jim Fleming. If you'd like to comment on what you've heard, we'd love to hear from you. Send us email through our website at ttbook.org. You can buy a CD of the show by calling the radio store at 1-800-747-7444. Ask for the program Einstein, God, and the Universe, number 16A. To the best of our knowledge is produced at Wisconsin Public Radio. This hour was put together by Steve Paulson, with help from Mary Lou Finnegan, Ann Strainchamps, Charles Monroe Kane, Veronica Rickert, and Doug Gordon. Our technical director is Kirill Owen. You can stream To the Best of Our Knowledge on our website at ttbook.org, where you will also find a link to the weekly podcast. PRI Public Radio International.